Now, the um, let's talk about where we're going uh, today. And so what, uh, what I want to do with you uh, real, kind of quickly is take you through the concept of, of motive, why motive matters. Um, and I'm going to drill into a couple pieces of this model that I find really interesting and a good launching pad. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about forgiveness and accountability and creativity and deliberation, just to give you a little sample of what this tool does. Uh, and then we're gonna, I wanna tell you a little bit about the development. Where did the model come from? Where did the tool come from? Um, uh, if you're interested in this kind of a session, I wanna give at least a little bit of information on that. And, the, um, and then talk about what some next steps are um, and, uh, and make sure you've got ample time to ask some of your questions. So that's where we're going. Um, and so, the question I have for you um, is, um, why did you come to today's session? I'm very, very grateful that you did. But why did you? If you could just chat in, if, if you care to, why did you come to today's session? There is no wrong answer. Like I said, I'm thrilled. Um, that, um, but, uh, but why is it? I'm wondering. Um, so so self-discovery, uh, just curiosity. I uh, love to learn new things. Um, uh, I'm always interested in new assessments. I'm curious in general. It's a new angle on things. I love to learn, love to learn. I'm a coach. I uh, want to understand how I can use this. You know? um, so learning about a new tool, familiar uh, with, uh, with the instrument and always want to learn more about it. Oh man, look at that. Thank you, Sue. Anything Hiles excited about, I wanna hear about it. So, so, so lots of different, comparing it to maybe the disc or the MBTI or something that you already know. Um, and so always interested in learning more about things. Okay, so wonderful, wonderful. Let's, uh, so the, the interesting thing, uh, so in terms of, so why did you come? Um, let me um, uh, talk about that. And so the, um, the, the idea of, of um, why is important. Um, and so there are lots of different reasons why one could come to a session like this. Um, and it could be that there's a, a commercial focus or a personal wealth issue that I wanna make money uh, either in my own practice, or I wanna be financially uh, uh, successful, I want the company to be successful. And I think this might be able to do it. So maybe you've got that kind of uh, motive or, or growth. A lot of you mentioned that that uh, I, I wanna develop, I wanna get better. I wanna, uh, I wanna grow and develop. Not only do I wanna do that, I wanna help other people do that. And that's why I came. That's the biggest reason I saw. It could be wisdom. Now wisdom here that I, I wanna learn it. I wanna be the expert. I wanna be able to own this knowledge myself. Um, rapport, it could be a personal connection. I, I wanna be nice. I wanna relate to others. Uh, and this will help me do that. Um, somebody asked me to come and so to be nice to that person I came. I mean, that's so maybe it's a rapport motive or competition. I wanna win. I wanna come out on top in this challenging world. And, and this might be a tool that helps me do that. There are any number of reasons why. There's not a bad one. But the idea of why is really powerful. It's really important. And so let me set it up this way. That behavior, behavior, is what you do, is what you say, it's the choices you make and how you show up to the world, all right? Now, um, so you show up and you're friendly and you help me out, you, or you actively work against me maybe, uh, you know, you fight me, you, you regret, you show regret, you say that you're sorry. Um, you know, you go here, you go there, you, you do whatever, that's, that's behavior, that's what you do. Well, Many tools in learning uh, development, somebody mentioned the DISC, that's an example of that, is uh, give you behavioral models. A lot of you are into the uh, emotional intelligence and, and uh, the EQI, that's a behavioral model. And it, uh, it, they're constructed to highlight, to access, and to kind of give us an understanding of what we do, sometimes even to predict that behavior. But behavior is about what we do. Now, motive, though, is a lot stickier, a lot more deeply rooted, a lot, uh, uh, I would argue, a lot more powerful. Motive refers to the conscious, and in some cases, unconscious need that we have that, that drives what we do, the why be, below the choices we make. So why do we show up that way? Why are you helping me? Why are you working against me? Why are you fighting me? 
why are you saying I'm sorry? And are you really? Um, the, uh, you know, why did you go here or there or wherever? So the, the, underneath that, um, the wave is something we can see. The current underneath the water, that's important to know about because that's what's pushing the wave. Now, um, really understanding somebody and, and practically really understand, being able to understand and really predict their behavior requires that you know not just the what, but the why beneath it, those needs, those values, those deep-rooted habits that are driving those behavioral choices. That's what the drive focuses in on. And so this is a unique new tool it's rooted in some kind of really nice research that's always nice to have behind a tool for individuals, for leaders, for teams, for systems. You can use this kind of at any level of the organization uh, that gives us kind of an actionable approach to the forces behind our behavior. So what drives us and what drains us? That's the drive. I wanna to talk to you about the, the model, just in general, I'm gonna race through it and uh, do some activities with you. Oh, I've got a video I wanna show you to, to kind of give you an access to what this thing is and how perhaps you can use it. Why at least I'm excited about using it in some different ways. So um, the, um, let's start here with forgiveness. Uh, there are 28, 28 different drivers in this model. So it's a whole bunch of them. Um, I just want to start with one. One of them is forgiveness. And this was actually the one I was most interested in. This is the hook for me personally in this. It was the doorway that made me want to walk through the whole thing. And so let's just think about forgiveness for a minute. Forgiveness is the drive to let go of the past uh, and maintain harmonious relationships that are free of resentment. So that's what resentment, I mean, I'm sorry, that's what forgiveness is in this context. And so if you think about that on a hundred point scale, so imagine forgiveness on a 100 point scale, the, the higher you are in forgiveness, the, the, the more that's a thing in your life, a driver in your life. That means that you're, you're driven to forgive, to let go of slights and wrongs and to have relationships that are kind of free of resentment. So the higher forgiveness is with you, that the more that's the case. Well, on the other hand, um, the lower forgiveness is for you. Um, well, that can sound negative. You're low in forgiveness. I mean, that doesn't, and no one wants to wear around a shirt that says I'm low in forgiveness. I mean, that's not a, a but the, but what that actually means is that I, I hold on to my history and my history with people. I, and I hold them to account for past actions. Well, that's a, a legitimate thing. And so if you think about yourself on the scale of zero to a hundred, um, uh, my question is, um, uh, where are you? Um, if zero means you never, never forgive and you actively avoid turning the page and 100 means you constantly forgive, um, then my question to you is just where would you rate yourself on a scale of zero to 100? And so just, Put a number in, and this is eyeballing it, of course, but just given what you know, where do you think you are? There's no right or wrong. It's not like the higher the number, the better it is. You could just chat it in. Um, uh, are you... Uh, so, oh, oh, there, there we go. Um, so, 40, 50, 67, 35, 70, 70, 40, 85, 80, 80, okay, okay. Uh, Trish, oh, hey, Trish, I didn't know you are here. That's great to see you. Uh, so 60, 50, all right, great, great. And so let's take a look at, um, so, so think about what your number is, not so much where everybody else is, think about your number. And let's, um, uh, I wanna take you back um, to, so what exactly does this mean? Um, the, um, if you're, Again, on the higher end, you, you tend toward forgiveness. If you're on the lower end, you tend towards accountability. If you're in the middle, a lot of you were. Uh, like between 40 and 60, you're kind of in that middle zone there. Scores in the middle of this uh, or, or any of the drive scales really suggest ambivalence. It's kind of a situational use of forgiveness. And so you're as likely to forgive somebody as you are to hold them to account. Tuesday you did, but Wednesday you didn't. Um, the, um, 
you approach forgiveness. So your approach to forgiveness, if you're kind of in the middle zone, the good news is it can seem flexible and uh, kind of pragmatic and the flexibility is always good. The downside of that is it can also seem inconsistent. And so I deal with you and I got it one time, but I didn't get it the next time. Or I saw he did, but she didn't. And so I'm not quite sure where you stand on that. And that's one of the arguable you know, downsides of being in the middle. Anyway, wherever you are, there's some juicy information about forgiveness. How can you use something like this? You know, what does forgiveness look and sound like? I wanna show you a movie clip. Um, and um, the movie that I, I'm gonna show you uh, before I, we switch over there um, is Invictus. If you haven't seen it, it's a Clint Eastwood movie that um, is about the um, uh, Nelson Mandela. And so just, I'm assuming uh, folks know, but he was, um, Nelson Mandela was a political prisoner held in prison over 25 years by the white majority government in South Africa. And he was released from prison, ran for president and won. And, um, and so as he took the presidency, um, the, uh, it was just a, major, a time of major change and upheaval in the country. So that's what is going on in this scene from Invictus. We get to see Nelson Mandela having a conversation with his chief of security. And so I think we get to see somebody who's high on the forgiveness scale and somebody who's low on the forgiveness scale talk to each other. I, if, see if you agree. But, um, and, um, and both seem really reasonable to, to me. But uh, check this out. It's about a minute and a half and, and I'll be back with you. The movie is Invictus. You look agitated here, sir. Well, that's because there are four special branch cops in my office. Oh, what did you do? Nothing. They say they are the presidential bodyguards and they have orders signed by you. Ah, yes, ah, yes. Well, uh, these men are special trained by SAS. They have lots of experience. They protected the class. Yes, sir, but it doesn't mean that they have to come. You asked for more men, didn't you? Yes, sir. I asked her uh, when people see me in public, they see my bodyguards. You represent me directly. The Rainbow Nation starts here. Reconciliation starts here. Reconciliation, sir. Yes, reconciliation, yes, sir. Comrade President, not long ago, these guys tried to kill us. Maybe even these four guys in my office tried and often succeeded. Yes, I know. Forgiveness starts here too. Forgiveness liberates the soul. It removes fear. That is why it is such a powerful weapon. Please, Jason. Try. Sorry to disturb you, sir. All right. And so I'm, I'm interested, let's go right from there into a question I have for you. What does the demonstration of high forgiveness look like? Let's go back to the, um, uh, uh, let's go back to the um, uh, uh, chat pod here. What does the demonstration of high forgiveness look like? What are the, the um, descriptors, the adjectives the, uh, that you would lay on somebody and um, uh, well, many of them might be very positive, but they're not all positive. I mean, so throw a wide net here. What does high forgiveness look and sound like? Um, and so the um, so empathic, uh, forgiving and forgetting, um, willingness to let go of grudges, uh, uh, the uh, acknowledgement of hope, Absolutely. Uh, overlooking of wrongs, trusting. There's a lot of trust that's communicated. That's a, that's a great word there. Wisdom, understanding, forward thinking, letting go, um, looking forward, not backward. That's really important. The, the part of forgiveness is looking for is, and enables me to look forward. Uh, the accountability, low forgiveness is backward looking, um, which doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just it, it's tied to that. Uh, there's a vulnerability. Um, Willingness to be wrong. Um, it's not easy to do and it provides some, some transcendence. So all is beautiful, beautiful uh, list there. 
yeah, I'm, we're going to come back to, to this, but while we're here, what does low forgiveness, so switch gears, what does low forgiveness look like? Um, and it's not all, all bad, so don't make it seem like high is good and low is bad. That's not how these scales are, structured, uh, are, are constructed here. There's a strong memory, um, uh, stuck in time perhaps, built on accountability. Um, the um, resentment hate, pettiness, inability to let go. So yes, that can, that can be true. Uh, that, uh, but justice, look at that. Justice, and uh, Tom, that's an important concept. And that's where it goes. The, I want justice. I want accountability. Um, the, um, and so, uh, so, so some dedication to self, but dedication to agreements, dedication to what we had said, uh, dedication to the rules, dedication to the norms that bind us together, and the fact that you thwarted them is important. Uh, and that, um, and so doing that doesn't necessarily mean I'm petty and small-minded. And uh, so fairness, uh, Don, uh, uh, that it's, if you're into, uh, uh, the, I have not seen the correlation of forgiveness and the Myers-Briggs scale, but that it's SJ behavior and very well could be if, if temperament and, and Myers-Briggs is something that's, that you're into. So great, great. So I, great um, uh, view of this. L let me go back to the slides and, and share with you some summary stuff here on, on this concept. And so if you are um, high in forgiveness, so if you forgive people more than other people around you, you may well be seen as, and you gave me a long, juicy list of, of things, and all that's true. But the summary is it's you're forgiving, you're compassionate, you're harmonious, all those things. And realize that if you forgive more than most around you, you can also be seen as soft, kind of weak will, lacking in fortitude, um, blind to justice, overly personal, overly sensitive. Um, and the um, uh, and Nelson Mandela, as much of um, uh, of a rock star as he is and was, he also had to battle the opinion that he was soft and weak willed and lacking in fortitude. That he was that he it, it was too quick to turn the page, and he had those same um, uh, stickers or uh, descriptors hung on him. So the um, that is um, high. Forgiveness, it's both and. Um, what does low forgiveness look like? A demonstration of low forgiveness, well, it, there's a lot of justice focus, there's accountability uh, in your orientation. Um, you can also be or look unforgiving, vengeful, vindictive, backward looking, kind of stuck in the past. Some of these are right off your list, stern, angry, mired in resentment. So all of those things are true. The interesting thing is where are you in the, um, uh, in the, uh, on the scale and, and what can you, uh, and how can you use that? And so wherever you are on the scale, what does that mean and how can I use it? And so one of the things I'm interested in, um, and I'm gonna just take you to the bottom line here to tell you about this, but how can you elicit forgiveness? It's one of my favorite uses of the drive. So how can you elicit forgiveness? Now we're, again, there are lots and lots of drivers here. Now we're only worried about forgiveness. Um, from someone who finds it draining. And so, so let's say I, I need to forgive because of my circumstance, because, but I really just, that's really hard for me. How do I do that? And so here is the, the model. I'm going to describe it to you later, but basically the, there are six basic factors within these factors are all of the 28 drivers. And it's these drivers that are most important. And one of the things I can do, if forgiveness is something I struggle with, I can actually use the uh, use another driver, something that's that I'm good at, something that is uh, that I'm attached to. I can use that one to help me out with the one that I struggle with. So, for instance, growth, growth. We have a, a a class today that is full of people that are into that are high in growth. A few of you would even come to a lunchtime webinar about a new model, a new tool, if you weren't kind of into growth. Uh, now, growth is the drive to learn and to grow uh, personally, professionally, to be, kind of be curious and open to the, the development and unfolding. Um, 
this is a, that you like to grow yourself and you like to bring growth to others. And in emotional intelligence terms, if you're if the EQI is one of your tools, this is a self-actualization kind of behavior here. Um, well, so I could actually um, task myself that, yeah, I'm, I'm low in forgiveness, but I need to learn how to do that because I will be a better father, a better partner, a better consultant, a better, what well, I'll be a better manager if I could forgive you and learn how to do that. And so I've really given myself a growth challenge and it's my attachment to growth that's gonna kind of help me pull forgiveness out of the ditch. So an, another uh, uh, focus could be um, inclusion. And so the idea with inclusion is that I, I wanna help other people to feel respected, to feel involved, and that others feel included in my activities and the activities of the group is very important to me. Forgiveness isn't a big deal with me, but you will feel more included and involved if I can forgive you and allow you in. And so it's my attachment to inclusion perhaps that enables me to forgive, or perhaps it's personal wealth. There's a, there's a, I've got a personal stake. I can get some money from this and there's more profit to be had and more financial independence and safety if I bury this hatchet rather than if I keep it going. And my financial incentive might be the one. Now, on the other side of this, um, what about, it's, it's not forgiveness I'm trying to boost, it's accountability. I'm so high in forgiveness and that's actually my story. My Ohio Rutledge story is that I'm really high in forgiveness. The challenge I have is when to let it go, is when to stop doing that. And so how do we do that? Well, my challenge could be a commercial one. And so it's good for the business if we hold this person or these people accountable. Um, and that is, um, and so personally, I, I wanna just let it go, but I need not to for the sake of what's good for us as a working group. Um, it's compliance. Compliance is a drive to follow the rules, to follow the processes as they are laid out. Um, and I, I just as soon let this slide, but the rules said you need to be held to account. And I care about those rules. And so let's do it. Uh, the, um, or, or perhaps it's alignment. That alignment is uh, the, the drive to be on the same page as everybody else, that we're all doing the same things, that we're hanging together. And well, being with you in that way, that we're all in alignment is important. I just as soon forgive you, but everybody else feels that it's important that we hold the line and, and hold you to account. So I will too. Alignment is that important. So you can take a uh, something that is um, a, a a driver that is strong for you and put it to work to help compensate for the ones that you need, all right? And so that is, uh, I, I wanna show you some other things and how we could use this tool and show you the, the model, but, but before we get any further, um, I'm interested in, we'll take a few minutes and see what questions you have about forgiveness or about anything else we've covered so far. And um, I know Harris, you've been maybe ca capturing some of those. Yeah, uh, we have we have one quick question, and then I see Lucy's got a question, so we'll go to Lucy right after. But uh, Pat asked, "Couldn't it be that you give someone the benefit of the doubt until they continue to disappoint, and then you start holding them accountable?" Uh, it, oh, it certainly can. So if we're if we're going to zero in on forgiveness, there, somebody who says that um, is is basically putting an, and hear me, I'm not saying no, no, no. That's a that's a bad. Uh, uh, approach to take, but what that's saying is that forgiveness is good and it's conditional, uh, that I give condition, uh, that I, I will forgive you as long as these things happen. Um, and so what that is somebody who's, who's open to forgiveness as long as they have these. Now that's the difference in a forgiveness 65 versus a forgiveness 90, because forgiveness 90 I mean, I'm making these numbers up, but I mean, the forgiveness now is, yeah, I'm going to do it. And it's rare that I don't. By it, I mean, uh, to forgive you, turn the page, let it go. The, um, I have to struggle not to let it go. Somebody that is, I, I'm, I'm wide open to forgiveness so long as these things happen is, uh, it, it is that's what a 60 to 70 thinks about. Now realize you could also in forgiveness be a 30 something, which is, 
I can conceive of forgiving you. I, I probably am not going to because I tend not to, but I can. Uh, and then you could even be a forgiveness 10, uh, which is, I, I just don't like it. It's, I'm almost allergic to the thought of it. And so realize that where you are along this line really does reflect um, uh, a, a, a different philosophy. That's what's driving you or draining you. And, and we're just talking about forgiveness. There, there are 28 different concepts here that kind of come together and get, give you some insight. But I think that nuance, uh, Pat, is a, I mean, is a great one. And so, yes, I think that's a good way of thinking about it. And Lucy, I think you were on deck. Was it Lucy? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Lucy. Hi, Haya. Um, I'm having trouble with the word forgiveness because I feel like it's often um, associated with emotion. And as an example, you know, I can let go of a grudge and, you know, if somebody wrongs me, then, you know, we can talk it through and I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to hold a grudge against that person. I can move past it. Um, but I also think, but I think that you can have high forgiveness and also hold people accountable because I think that whether we see it or not, all actions have consequences in one way or another. So two things about that, Lucy, that I want to comment on. And the, um, uh, the one, you, um, the, the second part and kind of the juice of your comment was that it's um, that you can have both of these things that you that you you can forgive somebody, but the um, but it's also important to do this. If you if you think about any of the things we're talking about in this binary state, do you forgive? Yes or no? It, it, the whole thing breaks down. This is not what we're talking about. The how how much of a driving force within you, within me, within each of us, is this concept of forgiveness? Um, the stronger it is, uh, the more I, um, I'm driven to do that thing, whether it's compliance or growth or commercial focus, forgiveness in this case. I, and, and that is in and of itself important. And I, and I don't care about the other. It's hard for me not to do it. The lower I am in it, the harder it is to even conceive of it. And I actually find myself even working against it. Now, so far, some of the comments have been, they, yeah, well, it's both and. Well, of course it is. The, uh, uh, and, and, and most people kind of think, well, yes, I'll forgive, but this has to happen. Or, or I'll, uh, uh, and, and there's some combination of the two. Uh, when you think about these kinds of scales, of course, it's a bell curve. And a lot, most people are kind of in the middle where one is kind of dependent on the other to some degree. Um, and that's the, um, so I think that's totally true. Now, one of your, the first thing you said, Lucy, that's really important, and we'll get back to the slides, but the, um, is that the, that your, um, that the word was problematic a little bit because it kind of denoted uh, some emotion. And this was a, um, and forgiveness is on, is in the factors in the grouping that has to do with kind of interpersonal relationships and connectivity is very much related to our subjective kind of emotional state and how we're connected emotionally to other people. So forgiveness is framed here as something that directly taps into that thing. Um, and so how each one of these words is defined, you might in your life define some of these words, you know, excellence, wisdom, forgiveness in different terms, which is totally legitimate. But this, like any tool, like the Myers-Briggs with thinking and feeling and, and, uh, and the disc with compliance, and uh, it, it, it defines it in a very particular way that within this model, this is what we're talking about. And, and having that clarity is, I think, is important. Um, the, um, and so the, um, let's, uh, let's go back. I want to shift and put, put a couple more things in. Now, remember, we're going to have lots of time at the end for, for questions. I really am interested in hearing what your questions are. Um, let's. Uh, but let's, I want to shift and, and show you a couple others that I think are, are really interesting. In fact, I want to show two and show how we can look at them together. And so one is creativity. So creativity is the drive to think, to solve problems in unique and different ways, to be kind of out of the mold, out of the box. Innovation lives here. So creativity. Um, if you're high in creativity, you, you're consistently and kind of continuously kind of driven to invent, to envision new ideas, new solutions, new ways of doing things. So that's the drive for what is called creativity here. Um, that the world 
sees people who are high in creativity as, as creative, clever, imaginative, innovative, uh, visionary, it can also come across as being or looking flighty, impractical, inefficient, confusing. I mean, that comes with the territory. Um, now, on the low side of creativity, now, here's another language issue. This, Lucy, you weren't talking about this, but it, it kind of reminds me of that, that, um, you know, I'm low creative. I mean, no one, uh, it's just an awkward label to wear on yourself. But the reality of this is that we've got to call the scale something. And the, um, and the uh, not being pushed by it, not being driven by this thing is not a bad place to be. So low creativity really means that you're attracted to the security and efficiency of a well-traveled path. You tend to be drawn to the known, to the established, to the answer or, or solution that's already been done. Why fix what isn't broken? That's not a bad question. Um, and so that can make people look practical, efficient, grounded in history. Uh, and the, um, it can also make you be, or at least look uh, uninspiring, boring, limited in scope, a small thinker. I mean, it, it comes with the territory. I mean, that's a, a and so you're, so we're somewhere along this line of creativity. Think about that. Think about where you might be. And I want to put another idea on top of this. Deliberation, deliberation. So deliberation is about the drive to be careful and thorough. And when considering an issue or making a decision to kind of pull um, uh, all data into the system before you pull the trigger. So this is motivated by a desire to avoid mistakes. And so I, I don't want to make a mistake in this, so I'm going to make sure that I have all the data before I move. Um, and so, um, so I'm going to uh, think about it, be very uh, careful about this. Uh, and in fact, I might even find myself deliberating or ruminating on things that I've already decided. Well, wait a minute, was that right? It was that I'm not sure I made the right decision. So that's high deliberation. So this makes you be or look thorough, cautious, careful, a good planner. You might be seen as a good planner with a lot of deliberation. At the same time, there's a certain degree of indecision, of kind of nervousness, maybe cowardly and timid, a, a procrastinator when it comes to decision-making. And on the other hand, if you're low in deliberation, it, man, let's go. You know, I, I, my approach to decision-making is life's too short. Well, you'll never have all the data, so let's just do it. Um, uh, the, um, which is going to make me look decisive, bold, and confident. It also may well make me look rash, short-sighted, foolish, and impetuous, impatient. Um, and so, the, um, so those things come with lower deliberation. All right, so let's think about those two things together and think about where you are when you lay these on top of each other. And so if you look at it in this kind of matrix, where you've got low and high creativity and low and high deliberation, you realize that it's possible. And think about us if, if we were colleagues. And so it's possible to be high creativity and low deliberation, high creativity and low deliberation. And so for this ease of understanding this, let's just assume we're talking about low high. Um, now, of course, these scales are zero to 100. So you can be anywhere along this line. But let's just, for this, think about low high. Um, and so high creativity and low deliberation means that I've, I'm innovative, I'm creative, I'm unconventional, and I'm fast paced and quick to act. All right. Well, realize it's also possible that uh, some of my colleagues could be high creativity and high deliberation. What that means, high creativity, that means I'm innovative, creative, unconventional, and I'm slow to decide and act because I'm loath to make mistakes and I want to make sure the direction we're going in is the correct direction to go in. That's high creativity and high deliberation. Well, you know, uh, it's possible that some of our colleagues are going to be low creativity and high deliberation. What this is, is somebody who's attracted to the known path or solution. Why fix what isn't broken? Let's stick to what we know. And I don't want to make a mistake. So let's go slow. Let's be deliberate um, in, in going forward. That's low creativity, high deliberation. Finally, you could have low creativity and low deliberation. And what this is like is somebody who's attracted to the known and proven path um, and uh, I'm fast paced, I wanna get things done. Let's keep doing it the way we've always done it because that's work, let's keep going and move it, move it, move it. And, the, um, 
And so you could be anywhere uh, along this. And what's telling is what collectives do. So I was working with a team not too long ago. There were six of them. And this is how they broke out. Uh, there were two of the six that were high creativity and low deliberation. Um, the, um, in fact, the, the leader of the six was in that group of two. There was one high creativity and high deliberation, and there were three that were low creativity and high deliberation. And it was this tension that I was most concerned with, and that was most rubbing them in a bad way. Um, and because think about it, we, you already know it, but let me quickly review it. In terms of creativity, um, the high creativity folks, that's in the, the bottom on the right-hand side, the high creativity folks, when they saw their uh, low creativity partners, um, they often saw it as you're uninspired, you're boring, you're limited in scope, you're thinking too small. Um, but yet the low creativity folks, when they saw their partners were frequently thinking, yeah, you're kind of flighty and practical, you're inefficient, you're constantly trying to reinvent a wheel that we already have done. And so they, there was really some struggle around that and understanding that. Now, on the deliberation side, that low deliberation saw the high deliberation as indecisive, nervous, uh, cowardly, and high deliberation saw low deliberation as foolish, as, as rash, as impatient, um, as dangerous. Um, and so the, um, so how these folks uh, and the um, worked out and how they, how we were going to get them to understand and kind of bridge that gap was, was what this tool pulled up to the surface to have us focus in on and work on. Um, and so one of the things that, um, uh, so, so just as an example, the, um, uh, I, I wanted to focus and we'll, we'll, I'm just going to give it 60 seconds. We're going to see if we can get a half dozen or more answers in here. But if we just looked at deliberation, we could look at creativity, but just for the sake of our focus, um, how might we help this group bridge the gap between deliberation and being more specific still? My question would be, if part of my goal was to try and be more sensitive to my staff that was, that was high deliberation, they were cautious, uh, a little risk averse, how could I help them be more open to risk? What what I need to do or what could I do to help them be more open to risk? Let's see if we just get a handful of answers. How do you help a group that is scared, cautious, deliberative be more open to risk? Now that's just approaching it, trying to uh, let have them let go of some of the deliberation. We could also approach this, how do we get the, the person to be more deliberative. But I'm, so we're just, for the sake of this conversation, we're just picking one of those. So acknowledge value of all of the perspectives. Um, can we agree the worst case scenario and that that won't likely occur? So can we uh, try and get around some of the catastrophizing by focusing in on your feared outcome that hasn't happened and likely will not? Um, come up with a clear process, use time-bound decision-making. Uh, uh, the um, relationships and trust are key. And um, uh, Christina, that is, is so true that part of the, um, that we, we need to do what we can to kind of create a protective space where you're safe to be afraid, uh, I, that we're, we're safe to talk about this. Uh, the, uh, so so we, we need some support rather than say, just get over it. Uh, that, and that's not gonna help. And so we, we actually need some relational nets to, and uh, an increased sense of safety produces more comfort, not comfort, but more comfort than you have now with the risk that we have. Um, the, um, so the, the kinds of ideas that you're coming up with is what the group needs to, um, you know, through facilitation here to come up with in terms of here's some things we could do to try and bend this together. So we're not framing each other so negatively and we understand why I'm, I'm driven toward deliberation or why you're uh, driven away from it. Um, so very, very good. We're gonna go back to questions, but, but first let me give you a little bit of, of insight um, the, uh, into the, the, this tool in the model where it came from. Um, and the, um, so all of this, the drive model, the drive tool is rooted 
in Ichik Eisen's theory of planned behavior. And this is a, a model that actually asserts that most of human behavior is actually rooted and driven by three factors, by three important factors. Um, motivational attitudes, um, values and norms, and long standing kind of deeply rooted habits and beliefs. And so let's take those in, in order. Um, the um, part of our behavior comes from mo our motivational attitudes. You know, do I want to do this? This is one of the reasons why this is not a model about motivation. This is a model about drivers. Now, motivation is part of that. Motivation plays a role, but motivation is one leg in this three-legged stool. And so to say this is a motivational model isn't entirely accurate. Um, uh, the, so my motivational attitude is, uh, do I want to do this? The, there's a cookie over on the counter. Do I want that cookie? So that's part of uh, uh, an issue of motivation. Separate from that, there are values and norms about that behavior. Do I think I should have that? Um, who deserves that cookie? What are the rules that I have within me or the norms about, about how many cookies I can, should eat? And, that? and so there are a bunch of norms that float around that actually control, do I take that or not? Um, and then lastly, habits and control beliefs. And so some of that is what do I actually believe I can do that I can achieve? How much agency do I have? Do I, am I empowered to actually go get that thing? Can I do it? Um, and so those are habits and control beliefs. And these three things together um, are, are where our drivers come from, the theory of planned behavior. And so the, um, they together kind of give us the why we do what we do. And so the, this model is um, designed. So the drive model, it was designed to help you us each to better understand, even predict our behavior. It was conceived and developed by Dr. Chris Coltis of LWF, Leadership Worth Following. They're kind of a new partner of ours. And, they, um, and there's some expansive literature and um, research review and where this came from. Dr. Coltis actually did um, a literature and research review across the field to see what were the most measurable and predictable leadership behaviors. Um, and so the um, over 45 behaviors were collected and kind of targeted from over a dozen different research and behavioral models. And from this group of 45, Research was done to kind of hone it down. Some were combined, some were dropped off that weren't as accessible. And what, what was wound up with was 28 drivers. There are 28 drivers that are in this drive model. And they, um, and they actually represent a, a nice kind of survey of the field. Um, and so the model is this, you've seen this, but uh, the, the correlation of these 28 drivers actually uh, led to them being grouped in these six different groups. And so this is somewhat uh, almost like they're put in these files for easier access and understanding uh, that um, because the, um, they, they were grouped together, they tend to kind of overlap and connect in these different ways. And the, um, so there are six factors within these factors are these drivers and it's the drivers that most matter. Just to show you quickly what they are. Um, there are actually uh, five uh, factors that are held together because of their collective um, uh, uh, focus on uh, being seen and heard and making a difference and doing that quickly. Um, and so charisma, commercial focus, courage, caution, and deliberation all focus in on impact. Impact is, is one of the two major leadership focused factors. Um, impact is one of them. The other leadership related a factor, the other one that, that is uh, prominently uh, associated with leadership issues is insight. And insight are the four factors that, uh, that point to or have to do with growth and development, with the drive or the urge to grow and develop, not only yourself, but how to push this out uh, to other people as well. We've got creativity, growth, wisdom, and compliance. Um, next are two factors that deal with uh, people and the interpersonal 
side of our lives and work. And one is connection. Connection has to do with work and the connection to other people through your work. And how driven are you toward that? We have collaboration, inclusion, rapport, and autonomy. Another interpersonally related factor we have is harmony. This is the biggest of the factors. There's seven within the harmony factor. And uh, this has to do with basically interpersonal closeness to those around you, honesty, forgiveness, service, authority, competition, personal wealth, and status all are within the harmony factor. And then we have productivity, which focuses basically, uh, it's four drivers that are focused in on basically getting stuff done and accomplishing tasks. So alignment, excellence, persistence, enjoyment. And then lastly, there are four factors within the meaning, uh, there are four drivers within the meaning factor. And this has to do with how driven you are to have your, your life and work um, uh, be connected to something larger than yourself, larger than life, and, and connected into a larger purpose. The, the meaning drivers are authenticity, legacy, purpose, and recognition. And so that just at least introduces you very quickly to the 28 drivers within this. What was interesting is in looking at the score clustering when, when as people were taking this, uh, 12 different profiles emerged. There were 12 different clusters that emerged with combinations of high and low. I'm high on these three and I'm low, and I'm low on these two. And the, the uh, and um, and there uh, and research also showed that when those were the case, when you had these score clusters, you also had uh, a certain degree of uh, predictable workplace attitudes. Uh, there were certain vocational interests that you tended to share. And so these, these 12 profiles emerged. So everybody falls into one of these 12 profiles within the drive, which is um, interesting. It's an interesting way to, uh, I, I think in the conversation, it could be an interesting way to start it. It's again, it's those 28 drivers themselves that are gonna be the most important. Um, and the, um, the, the drive comes in uh, as we kind of uh, kind of wind up here toward the end. The drive comes in in three separate uh, tools right now. There's a, a leadership report, a, a team and group report, and a 360 report. And the um, and so those are uh, available. When you take the drive, you actually get detailed information on each of these 28 drivers in terms of. Uh, so what, uh, what is your score and what does that mean? Because it has a different meaning depending where you are along that continuum. And, um, and so what that means and then how to deal with it. What do you do with that information is, is an important question. Um, uh, one of my favorite places within this is the driver's ranking page. It's almost like an executive summary page at the end that has all 28 of your drivers listed in descending order. So you can see these are the things that really push me boldly and these are the things against which uh, I, I act. And so these are the things that most drive me. These are the things that most drain me. Um, I like looking at the top seven only because that's, uh, they're 28. So the top seven are your top quartile or the top 25%. And, um, and so just taking a look at here's uh, what's particularly driving me and particularly draining me. The bottom seven is, of course, your bottom quartile. And so it's um, interesting to take a look at, at that, uh, at the drivers just um, by themselves. Um, uh, what we have done, um, OKA has partnered with LWF and um, written a, a workbook. It's called Drive to Action. It was just sent to the uh, printer yesterday. I mean, so it's uh, it'll, it will have them here in about a week for our first um, certification class. But it um, it's a big 64 page uh, workbook that actually takes you into uh, the um, uh, each one of these uh, drivers, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what your score particularly means, how to uh, use these scores in terms of energizing and optimizing and leveraging effectiveness within each one. So there's a lot of, a lot of juice that this um, is intended to help you squeeze out of your drive report. Um, and the, um, uh, I wanted to let everybody know as we're approaching the top of the hour that as a thank you for attending today, um, if you are interested, you can take 
the drive and get some feedback for it, um, uh, uh, get some feedback on it. I mean, for free, of course, as a, as a thank you for your interest so far. And so um, Harris will reach out to you, my colleague Harris Vanderoff will, so you can reach out to him or he's already gonna reach out to you. And if, uh, if you would like to take it and we'll schedule a, a brief um, feedback session. So uh, if, if that interests you, that, that would be terrific. Take it a level deeper. Uh, do be aware that the, we have a certification program that we're launching. A launch it week after next. Actually, it's a it's two days live online. Um, uh, Melissa, my uh, longtime colleague and friend, has uh, asked about it, are there on person in person uh, things, and there will be hopefully as early as this summer. Um, but uh, but right now, uh, as with all of our offerings, it's still online only at this point, and so the. Um, uh, it's designed and delivered by uh, by me. You get to take and receive your own drive report, but we'll explore how to apply it, what to do with it. There are a number of leadership applications and um, uh, a team applications, and the um, how to use the team report and the 360 report. Uh, you get to get somebody else's report and learn how to give feedback to them. So we'll, all of that's covered in this um, uh, experiential uh, workshop. The first one, um, and it's Still not, we still have some room, but it's a, a, a we're, we're pleased with the, its reception as uh, March 22nd and 23rd. The next one's in April 13 and 14, although we've got others coming coming up throughout the year. So it's not like it's these two are bust, but, um, but uh, you can think about that. It's uh, $1,800 if you're interested in, um, in that for the two days. And that includes the binder and the workbook and everything else that you need. And so you can see us online or reach out to um, Harris, uh, banner off uh, to to get more information if you if you would like it um, and so that is um, I know we're coming up to the top of the hour but um that's the um that is the model I'm really interested in uh, the questions that you have and so Harris do you have yeah. a, a yeah to, thank you Kyle uh, the first question was around hey there are so, there were a couple of questions about this hey there are a couple of drivers that don't seem like they make sense inside that factor okay and so I explained the inverse correlation but if you can kind of drill down and explain that that would be really helpful sure just in general or uh, just uh, were there any specifics or, or it was the authority inside harmony I think was okay. the example and the but, um, uh, no that that's that's a good one and so when you just so that I can have a, a visual, let me let me go back real quickly to this. And um, again, if you up at the top of the hour, if you need to scoot, you can know that this uh, is being recorded if you want to come back to it. But if, if, if you do need to jump off, thank you very much for being here today. And I hope uh, hope to see you again soon. The um, one of the uh, just to go back to the specific content on this question uh, that when um, we're talking about using your uh, this one, for instance, um, that uh, Harmony has, um, again, is about interpersonal closeness. And so the, these seven have to do with closeness. Now, honesty, forgiveness, and service are positively correlated to harmony. So that means high honesty, high forgiveness, high service are connected with harmony. It turns out that authority, competition, personal wealth, and status are negatively correlated, just like Harris said, to Harmony. So a low score in authority. Uh, I, I, I'm not very competitive. I, I, I don't care that much about personal wealth. I, I, I'm, I'm not really into status. Those things are correlated with high harmony. Um, similarly, just as, a, as an example, the, um, uh, when we look at connection, uh, the um, collaboration, inclusion, and rapport are positively correlated. And so the uh, being high correlation, high inclusion, high rapport is connected to this idea of connection. Um, low autonomy is. And so generally a high connection score, the factor high connection score means that I'm high in collaboration, high in inclusion and rapport and low or lower in autonomy. That's how you have the perfect storm of high connection, and so that's when uh, when you first see this, it could be well, wait a minute, that doesn't seem to that doesn't seem to fit. That would uh, th that would be why it's a great catch, and I yeah I sh should have mentioned that I was going so quickly through there. Uh, thanks, Hal. Second question: We have a couple questions around this. 
with regards to are our drivers able to change or are they innate in us and, and they'll never change? What is, what's uh, kind of the answer? So uh, can a driver change? Yes. Do drivers tend to change? No. Now that's a frustrating answer. That's, that's right, but it's a frustrating answer. The, um, as a, from an instrument perspective, this, these are stable variables in terms of test retest, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's relatively high. And, and so these tend not to change. Um, there are some that are more open to change with age than others. Like for instance, um, uh, status and personal wealth are, are two uh, that, that change with age in terms of um, that the older one gets. So statistically speaking, the older one gets, the more personal wealth uh, decreases and the more status decreases. The younger you are, the more those things are important. Uh, and the um, and so the, there's some things that that have some slight shifting with age. Um, and of course, that um, because if you think back to Ichik Eisen's theory of planned behavior, that some of these are so that this is rooted in in what we want and what our values are. And so as our values change, that's hard for our values to change, but they can in terms of, I didn't, this used to not be on my radar screen, but now it is. Uh, I've seen people grow and change and have almost like paradigm shifts in terms of the values that I hold and how I rank order things. And that could lead to some shifting of drivers. So can it happen? Yes. Does it tend to happen? No. And when it does rather slowly. So these tend to be fairly stable variables. That's one of the reasons why it's a tool that a lot of people are looking to, to um, use in selection. It, and it can be used in selection. That's not how we, are, that's not its greatest gift. Um, uh, so like along with emotional intelligence, there are, um, it, it's, it's a good tool to be used that way. It can be used that way. Although the gold within the drive is really about self-awareness and self-management, not selection, but uh, but they are stable variables. Uh, so uh, Yeah, thanks, I Kind of to elaborate on that, we had a lot of people ask, hey, what's the goal with, with taking this? What are, uh, we had someone ask, hey, hey, would you, uh, is the goal to strengthen the top drivers and mitigate the bottom drivers or just elaborate a little bit on how you see this working inside organizations? And so, yeah, that's a great, that's kind of the essence a question there. And um, I believe that this is a, um, th that the, the, to do any meaningful work in terms of uh, leadership, team, organization, anything, it is all based on self-awareness. And so our approach forever here at OKA has been greater self-awareness leading to better self-management. And we use the Myers-Briggs that way. We've used emotional intelligence that way and, and over a dozen other tools that way. This is no different in terms of uh, rather than just understanding my behavior, can I understand why I'm driven toward that behavior or away from it? And once I know that, now here's the essence of, of the, that question. Once I know that, how can I use that? And so there are a few different ways and I, I don't wanna get too lost in the weeds here, but that really is the, is the juice of it. That one is energy. And so my understanding, my energy and yours, because part of this is if, if I'm driven towards doing this. So imagine I'm, I'm holding a gyroscope. And a gyroscope if it is, is just wound up and it's working and it's traveling in a certain direction. It's very hard for me to even take this offline because it's just driven to go in one direction. And so if I know that, one of the ways I can better be more effective and more energized in my life is to understand why this is going in this direction and trying to live a life in which I can go in that direction. And so how can I acknowledge and service my drivers? Um, and so that I'm not fighting the natural tendency because that tendency is not gonna change very much. Um, and uh, is one thing. Um, also, if I can help you do the same. Uh, similarly, I can avoid the things that I'm low in. Uh, drivers that don't really, I, I don't like them. They're kind of distasteful. I well. Can I put myself in situations where I don't have to do that so much the better? So that's one way, that's an easy quick hit. The other is that leveraging idea I was talking about. Some of this, even though I struggle with, I struggle with 
um, with growth. I struggle with uh, with compliance. I struggle, and that's a big one. Like for me personally, I struggle with compliance. I'm not much of a rule guy. And in fact, the more rules you put in front of me, the more compelled I am to ignore them and break them. And the and that's not helpful. Uh, th th there are lots of times when that's not helpful. In life, maybe that's fine. But this morning, as I walk into the DMV, I just need to suck it up and take that clipboard and sit down and wait my turn. I, I, so I, what do I need to do to hook compliance today? And can I use my uh, another driver that is easier for me to kind of help that out? Can you use a strength to help you today? That kind of leveraging is, um, is very, very powerful. And so there, um, and then how do I use this as a leader? How do I use this as a team? Uh, so not, it's not just me, I've, I've got to kind of push the system out. And, um, and so I find it helpful in all of those ways. We got, thanks, Hal. We got a couple of questions around, around why did OKA decide to bring this tool on to, to our tool belt and, and sort of how it interacts with the different tools that we have. And so that's a, that, uh, that's a great, a fair question. We have a lot. So why, why do we need another one? And um, one thing we've uh, in recent years have been very, very active. I mean, we're one of the leading voices in emotional intelligence and the EQI, which we love and that's not going anywhere. Um, and the, uh, but one of the things that makes that model so compelling is it's a behavioral model. So we'll talk about empathy. Uh, we'll talk about flexibility and, we'll, and, 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 um, and here's what that is and here's how you get better at it. That's great. But nowhere in that is, well, why? Uh, why are you so driven towards empathy and I am not? In fact, I kind of get irritated when I see you doing it. And so what's, uh, so why is that? Uh, and this is the why behind that what. And so it, uh, this doesn't replace uh, the Myers-Briggs, this doesn't replace the EQI, uh, but it, it, can, uh, it stands alone actually, but it also works very nicely with it because it, it gets into a corner that our other tools did not. Um, in terms of understanding why. Let's go, let's take a deeper dive and understand the drivers beneath what you're doing. And, the, um, and so if, if the essence of our work is, and it is and always has been, always will be while I'm here, is that uh, if you wanna do good work, it starts with greater self-awareness leading to better self-management. What a powerful thing to get to know, not just what am I doing and what are my habits, but why am I headed in that direction? That's a pretty big one. So that's why it, it has had a, found a, a nice home here. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Hal. We had a, uh, one question about, hey, can you explain, uh, say something about reliability and reference samples when it comes to the, the tool? Yeah, now the, um, so in terms of the, um, the studies that were done, the, the norm groups, uh, about 4,000, just under 4,000 in size, a good size norm group, the, um, the uh, reliability studies that were done are, um, were of course internal consistency and test retest reliability. So internal consistency within uh, the, the creativity or growth or wisdom drivers, how consistently are, are the uh, items measuring the same thing and internal consistency. Although when most people think about reliability, they think about test retest. And so the, the studies, the, the average interval and the test retest studies were, uh, I think it was 180 days. Uh, and the, uh, so it's up to a year, as little as six weeks. And the, uh, in terms of uh, looking at test retest and of course, test retest uh, 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 reliability. So in terms of how consistent were the results over time, um, varied on each scale, of course. And the, um, and the average was uh, 70, 73, 74%, which is about even most, most tools are in the, are in the, they, uh, in the 60s and 70s, but it, it really needs to reach 70%, uh, a, a, seven, a 0 0.7 uh, coefficient is considered kind of standard. And so this is 74 plus percent on average. And so it's a, and some, some, a few fell below that and a number were up in the eighties. And so, but, but the, but the overall average is really what you want that, uh, and that's uh, pretty high. So. I, I hope, hope that helps on the reliability. Yep, we got, uh, Kim had the question, have you found this tool to be helpful to build trust quickly among teams? And so the, um, 
Yes, and the only thing I would say, that the only thing that makes me nervous about your question, Kim, because it's a great one, is quickly. I mean, so there, there are some uh, that I, I find the best tool, and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to diminish the drive here, the best tool to help us with trust is whatever tool you and I will both agree to use. I mean, and so, uh, and that sounds silly, but if it's Myers-Briggs, like I'm not a DISC fan, personally, I'm not a DISC fan, but, um, but if it's already in a system and people are used to it and they know it, let's use DISC, let's, and I'll lean into it. Let's, let's, uh, because if it's a vocabulary we can use where I can talk about me and I can see myself in these results and, and understand you a little bit better, then it's a, let's use that. And, the, um, and so that's the first thing is let's establish a vocabulary that helps us reframe each other and, and in a helpful way where we're giving each other handles on us in a helpful way and then learn to talk about it and use them. And so the quickly is uh, if a group is ready to get there, um, then they'll go quickly. The drive doesn't make it quick. Um, but neither does the DISC or the MBTI or the EQI or any other thing you, you would say. It's, it's, we determine is it quick, not the tool. Um, and so I do find this is, is useful. One of the things that helps with trust, I think, Kim, with this particular tool is that um, unlike some other, most tools when you look at them, high is good and low is bad. Um, and this so clearly is structured in a way that if you're really driven towards this, this is what it looks like. And there's some good news there. And also be, beware that it can look like it's not. I mean, there's some ways in which that can count against you. On the low side, there can be good news there. Uh, and the um, even low forgiveness, it turns out, was, well, people caring about justice and accountability. I mean, well, that's a good thing, obviously. Uh, and, the, um, and so there's always good news with a caveat. Beware, this is what it looks like when it's too much. And so the, the neutrality, the value neutrality of, of these scales is really, really important. And I think if you're gonna build trust, um, one, it can help if we introduce something new. Um, let's do the Myers-Briggs. Well, you've had the Myers-Briggs 12 times. I haven't had it at all. You're already more advanced than I am. We're on the different playing field. And so sometimes it helps when we're all learning something newly, freshly, um, and that something that is value neutral. Um, and so for those reasons, I think it's a particularly good uh, tool around trust, but there's, you, you just can't put trust on a timer, which I know you know that, but I mean, but that's the, that's the, beware any tool, including this one that's, oh, wow, we'll have you trusting by the end of the day. It's like, ah, no, no, you won't. Uh, yeah. um, and if you did, it was because of our work, not any tool that you sold me. So just, be, just beware of that just in, in life, but, um, but great question. The, the, the last I'll, question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So, Good. Uh, last question that I have in, in the queue here is: Were the results correlated with with job performance? Yeah, yes, th there were um, many tools. There are over a dozen tools that um, that were correlated with the drive, and all of that's in the in the manual. And some of them were um, uh, so vocational interest, not good at their job, bad at their job. Um, and so I, I, I haven't seen anything that related this to um, good performance, bad performance, but, uh, but there have been a number of, there are some different vocational um, uh, tools in terms of what career did you choose and what is your drive? And that really looked at the, that's really what drove a lot of those profiles that we looked at in terms of, because a lot of people who are high in these three drivers and low in these two drivers happen to like careers where they are kind of behind the scenes and not, and so, I mean, so there are a lot of, of vocational details that were attached to that. And so that kind of study, I think was, um, uh, I mean, it, it, it went through a lot of those studies before it ever hit the public and those are documented well. And, and you, we just got one more and you kind of answered it here, but was it validated and what was used to assess the validity? Well, and so, and so validity, there are a few things that assess validity and that to any good tool, and this is one of them. And so there are a lot of correlative studies. And so uh, that where, let's, so let's uh, correlate the drive to the big five and the CPI, the California Psychological Inventory. And, and of, of course there's Myers-Briggs and, and other tools, although Myers-Briggs has always had a psychometrically fraught 
history and uh, and so the, the, linking something to the Myers-Briggs doesn't help it in terms of its psychometric validity out there in the world. But uh, with the big five and the CPI and there are another of the tools that uh, for which that is the case. The, um, it also with, um, uh, so one of the things that it, it, uh, in terms of, of job connection and, and so in terms of it, you would expect certain drivers to lead people to do careers where those drivers are active. And so those, those vocational linkings uh, uh, work there. Um, and now as, uh, and also another check for validity, because validity of course means accuracy, uh, and another check for validity is also reliability. So reliability is just consistency, it stands on its own. But if a tool is also accurate, if a tool is also valid, then it is also reliable. And so all of its reliability comes in as a, as a, a check to say, see it is consistently finding these things. Um, my favorite, uh, uh, piece of validity though still, um, and this is because I'm a long time Myers-Briggs guy and development guy is, um, is self-validity and um, which a lot of psychometric people don't care about, but I want people to see their report and go, wow, yeah, I, I, I see myself there. It's, it's, it's legit. I, can, I, I see myself reflected in this mirror. Um, and because once that happens, uh, then then we can actually do some work with it. And so the so that self validity is still that they don't claim that as one of their as, as psychometric proof, but that's still where the rubber meets the road for, I think for a lot of us certainly for me on a day to day basis. Yeah, they call it face validity. Yeah, and um, and that's a uh, uh, and so uh, that that's an important piece that is marginalized by numbers, folks. But it's it's where the work is often done. So. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. Cool. Good, but, but thank you for that. Uh, any, anybody else? So I think we, uh, we outweighed a lot of the, a lot of the folks. So we're down to, to just the uh, core 20 who really want it. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah. Woo! Um, uh, so, um, but anyway, any, anybody have a, a, a question or a comment or a, um, maybe you put something in the chat that I, was too busy looking at the camera and didn't pay attention to, you could bring up in person or? Good to, good to see uh, you. I'm glad everybody was, um, was able to, to make it. And thank you, Harris, for all of your help. I couldn't do this without you. Um, and so um, uh, do you wanna talk about reaching out to folks with the- um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody that, that came today, I'm going to send a thank you for coming. I'm going to send a recording of this webinar as well. If you're